LinkedIn presents. Why are you starting a podcast trying to make me cry? That's a dirty trick. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Welcome to Rethink Moments, the show that explores culturally significant ideas and events that in some way changed how we think and rethinks how these moments changed us. What went right? What went wrong? And what was learned? I'm your host, Rachel Botsman. Here are the races we are still watching. Ohio, too close to call. And uh, this could be uh, a while, given the 16% raw vote in. Georgia, too close to call. Another closely watched state in the South. In the autumn of 2016, tens of millions of Americans went to the polls to decide if Secretary Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump would become their next president. Today's episode begins on that momentous Tuesday, November the 8th, in the final throes of an ugly and divisive race for the White House. Yeah, so the way that the election night was supposed to go... This is Genevieve Roth. At the Javits Center, we had this special suite reserved for celebrities and influencers who had been really helpful to us on the campaign. It was full of people like CB Wonder, Katy Perry, Amy Schumer, I can't name... There were so many different people. And they were all folks who'd been really sleeves up in the work and felt at that point like they were part of the campaign with us. Genevieve reels these names off. But this is her job, was her job. She played a senior role in the Clinton campaign, bringing Hillary's message to the people via some very well-known and trusted ambassadors. So, it's election night. Stevie Wonder, Katy Perry, Amy Schumer. And we had them all kind of in an area, um, hoping to be able to celebrate the win. And you start, and it's a really convivial, incredible environment and you're seeing all these people that you've been working with and you're with your colleagues that you've worked so hard with and it's a little out of body. I was watching the returns on MSNBC like everybody else. And then I actually was pulled into the stairwell by a friend of mine who was watching and he just looked at me and he said, Genevieve, we just lost. Today, we're going to hear how that catastrophic defeat gave Genevieve the passion and strength to keep fighting to tell important stories with powerful people, and how the loss, in unexpected ways, gave her the freedom to keep learning. Stay with us. Genevieve Roth is the founder of the social impact and culture change agency Invisible Hand. She has worked with the Clintons, the Obama Foundation, and most recently, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. In March 2016, Genevieve left her high-profile role at Glamour magazine, where she pioneered the Women of the Year Awards to become Director of Creative Engagement for Secretary Clinton. And I was curious to know how she first started to process that election defeat. Yeah. Um, how did I start to process it? It's funny, I was watching, I saw a YouTube clip yesterday, I think it was Andrew Garfield, that called Grief Love Unexpressed, and it hit me so well. Um, because that grief was exactly that. It was optimism for the country. It was joy for this incredible, incredible leader and all she would do. Um, love for who we can be as a people um, when we center the best of ourselves. I probably did some relatively basic things. I, I got sleeves up and went right into organizing. That's what, that's my energy, right? So I right away started working on the Women's March and many of the people who had been in the work with us on the Clinton campaign went right into putting that together and what a moment that was. Um, I went on a retreat and, you know, did some, did some yoga and cried into some pillows. Um, and then I think there's that, you know, people talk about the stages of grief and they've added this sixth stage, which is about meaning making. And for me, what this has been, has been about redoubling that belief that got me to the campaign in the first place, which is that we are more alike than we are different. 
that the best of us is the best of us. And that if I could ignite that and move people with storytelling and creative engagement and that work, um, that it was just my job to get better at it. And that if we weren't going to be doing it at the White House and we damn well better be doing it everywhere else. You know, I think we realized we really had to shore up other areas. I'm really fascinated by how you influence a belief and when that's right and when that's wrong. And I'm interested in your experience of how you moved people. How did you use storytelling and use the power of celebrity to connect that to who she was as a candidate? Oh, God, goodness. I could talk to you about this for hours. The first thing is that storytelling has the opportunity to make a real emotional connection. What gives you authentic permission to be speaking about a topic? She tells the story of working with influential Philadelphian rapper Freeway as a powerful example of getting the right storytellers in the right places to drive change on the ground. He was Philly's own. He was somebody who had real lived experience about the issues that we were talking about. He'd, he'd had some hard knocks. He was on dialysis during the 2016 campaign. I have these really visceral memories of planning visits to college campuses and having to map dialysis centers. And when he got on stage and he talked about Hillary's health care plan, he was talking about what he needed. He was talking about what his family needed. And people believed him because he was using the systems. He was reliant on them working or not working. And he'd put in the hard yards to be trusted by that community. And if we'd made a mistake, if we'd put someone arguably more famous, right? If I'd put someone who was a tremendous surrogate for the campaign, Lady Gaga, who I was with on election night, we did a midnight concert with. If I put her in that college campus in Philadelphia and asked her to say, Hillary's healthcare plans are the best, she's got it right, go with her. She'd have been telling the truth, but it wouldn't have rung as true to the audience because of their personal connection, that proximity and that authentic permission that Freeway had. It's so, it's so interesting. I love that phrase, authentic permission. Do you think people know what they have permission to talk about? Mm. Or is that something you often help them discover or find for themselves? So some of it's obvious, Right. If I'm from a place, I can talk about that place. If I have a mom, I can talk about my mom. This is not to say that someone like Philly Freeway or Lady Gaga can only speak to people who share their experiences or from their town. We all believe Dolly Parton, right? Like there are certain people who just have for whatever myriad, like strange, magical combination of reasons, earned trust at a high level with people they don't, they don't appear to have anything in common with. And that's the real magic. She's so right about Dolly Parton. Part of Genevieve's role was to figure out how to use celebrities, musicians and artists, what she calls surrogates in campaign parlance, to earn the trust of voters at an enormous scale. So when someone is running for office, there's one of them and hundreds of millions of people to convince. And so the surrogate function of a campaign is to put people who can be the voice and perspective of the campaign all around the place that you're trying to win. And the surrogate department covers all manner of people who can draw heat and attention to the election and the candidate when they need to be somewhere else. I had developed this theory of the case, right, which was that I, I had seen if you took somebody that people were interested in, a Malala, a Melinda Gates, a Lady Gaga, a Barbara Streisand, and you gave them, you know, and their message, whatever it was they were trying to accomplish in the world, and you put it in front of the right audience. At the heart of what Genevieve calls the case is a tie between trust, authenticity and empathy. People tend to trust you more when they believe they're interacting with the real you and when they feel like you genuinely care about them. I genuinely believed that that mix of art and science made the world better and that it was the most effective way to spawn social change. It was sort of the closest thing to a religion that I had. And so when I got to the campaign, my intention 
was to use those skill sets and put them onto the campaign. And right away I thought, okay, this has got to be about more than just sending former members of the West Wing into battleground states. This is really about how art and inspiration can spin the world forward. So the campaign, we know how it ended and it wasn't clearly a success for Hillary Clinton. But looking back... Were there things that you think your team got right? I think that theory of the case, that passionate storytelling done well in front of passionate people as a tool to galvanize and change the world is as true as a thing that will ever be. And I think it's predicated on this belief that if people know better, they'll do better. And if they know different and are given a better methodology, that they'll rise to that moment. It's an optimistic view of the country and of the world. And I think we knew that going in. And I I think we're, you know, that's a foundational belief. I think we were right about that then. And I think we're still right about that. It's interesting um, you say that because I'm thinking about research I've been doing on why do people hold on to their beliefs? Mm. Um, So what causes you to hold on to a belief? And I call them pulls, right? So you're pulled onto something, to hold on to something. And it doesn't matter what the belief is you see these three pools, um, ego, belonging, which you could call conformity, um, and control, Mm. the need for control, which is very tightly tied to fear. So it's interesting that you can have two people with completely polarizing views, but the same forces underneath are pulling them to hold on to it. The music behind the lyrics is, is the same. Stay with us. We'll be right back. I've got to ask this question, though, because you, you've been talking about the truth. What happens when, and I, I go back to the campaign, when you're working against a tide when the truth isn't true? I mean, yeah. I think, first of all, I think there's a, there's a, a, a critical distinction between truth, what I would call sort of capital T truth, and what I would call common facts, Right. Which also comes up against, and this is also, if you are a media nerd, like I am a media nerd, it's so fascinating that we have no common set of facts and we have no moral authority, right? Mm -hmm. I think that capital T truth differentiates itself from common facts when attached to authenticity and beliefs, right? And for an organization or an individual and an institution, what I mean by saying make it true isn't necessarily the same thing as saying make it adhere to a common set of facts. It means make it defensible. Make it something you truly believe. Don't lie to yourself in the process of building this work, right? And then that's defensible. It doesn't necessarily have to be universally a believed right? But is it defensible? Is it your belief? Would you stand in front of it proudly or next to it proudly? That is the kind of personal truth I'm trying to get folks to. And then of course you have to meet that with strategy. And is it going to, you know, how is it going to meet the moment? And how is the, and how is society at large going to react to something? But by golly, if you're going to put yourself out there like that, you really got to believe it. So from your perspective, Genevieve, Was there anyone in the team at any point that saw this going wrong, either because people weren't getting a real sense of who she was, the real Hillary? Or I'm just interested in were there blind spots in the team that now people talk about and why you didn't see them at the time? There's always a, what's the phrase, like a Monday morning quarterback. Um, You know, when you're on, when you're doing something like this that's public, there's no shortage of people who are telling you what you're doing is wrong. And I think any time you're up against a a big pursuit, creative, political, business, personal, um, the challenge is to figure out where your own voice is and what you think is a good idea and follow that good idea. And I, you know, I was a newbie to campaigns at that time, but that's a lesson I've taken from this, which is that if you're going to be hearing from a chorus of opinions about what's correct and what's not correct, you're never going to know until you're on the other side of it. So you have to put together work that you can really stand behind 
and believe is the truest and best form of what it is that you're trying to do. And if you learn lessons, then you take them on and you're better, you're better for the next go round. Um, but no, everyone will tell you that you're doing it wrong. And if things had gone differently on that Tuesday, all those years ago, everyone had been telling us we've been doing, you know, that they were telling us to do it exactly how we'd been doing it. And that's just what it's like to do hard things. Hmm. You know, it's funny, um, I'm sure many listeners haven't been on a campaign, but they've experienced some kind of intensity. It could be a run up to a product launch, some kind of thing they've been working on for a long time. And you do get that feeling like you're in a bubble. And I wonder if you learned anything through the experience of how you still get that outside perspective. You, you personally get someone that can challenge what you're seeing, what you're thinking, what you're feeling, and whether that's been a learning from working on these really intense campaigns. Well, I've always loved advice. And I've always tried to put myself in rooms where I was the least experienced person in the room. So that's just a, that's just, for me, that's always been a guiding principle that I want to have enough belief in my ability to learn and, and have kindness and gentleness for my, for my missteps that I'm going to try to put myself a little over my skis every time. Um, you know, I read a story once about how it's so fascinating that you have, you know, when you're a little kid or you're in high school or what have you, we have coaches, we have coaches for basketball, we have teachers that help us to do things. And then all of a sudden they graduate you into your professional life and you don't have coaches anymore. Or, you know, if you're a surgeon or you're a, um, you're a teacher, no one's going to be giving you that outsider wisdom to tell you. But if you're LeBron James, you're getting coached every day. So do I think that I have learned to get that outsider knowledge. Um, if I didn't know it before, then sure. You know, yes, but I think I've always believed that there's wisdom in that. And I think that everything I have done since 2016 has been about being in dialogue with that question um, that really opened up on the campaign for me, which is that how do we use art, story, and culture, to, um, culture storytelling to spin the world forward and make the world better. Because, you know, by all intents and purposes, we ran the best and most sophisticated surrogates and creative apparatus in the history of the game. And we all know what happened on that day. Um, and I learned a lot about the space I wanted to be in. And I don't have any answers, but I'm going to spend the rest of my life being in dialogue with that question through a series of hopefully more graceful than not graceful experiments. Um, and I absolutely am going to continue asking people who think differently than I do what they think about my work. Let's switch gears slightly and talk about the work you've been doing since then, which is just phenomenal and fascinating. Um, and one of the things that I've always admired about you, Genevieve, is that you work alongside powerful people, some of the most powerful people in the world, and they clearly listen to you. How do you get them to listen to you? Oh, gosh. I mean, you'd have to ask them and maybe, I don't know. I think um, since I started Invisible Hand, I don't think I have been on a client call in the beginning where somebody hasn't asked me, how do we get it done? How are we going to accomplish or we want to accomplish, whether that's, you know, whatever it is, whether that's money raised for a campaign or a shift in a vote or a change in a belief system. And my answer to the question is always the same, which is the first thing we have to do is we have to make it true. Everything we do has to be founded on truth. And what that means in practice is that if you are a, I don't know, I'm going to make this up, a technology company that is, um, a hard place for people to be in terms of their mental, mental health. I said, you have to be better and then we'll accomplish it. You have to make it true. It has to get better. And so I think probably what happens is that, and this is, you know, sort of tied to your work, Rachel, with Trust Barometer. Um, I think if you make it true enough times in a row, then people know you're not going to lie to them. They know that you're going to give them your best and most honest answer um, all of the time, but it takes time. You know, I don't start these relationships with the assumption of trust. I believe all relationships should start with the presumption of good intention. 
But then what I really try to do is deliver results right away. And the relationship and the trust come secondary. I earn it. Intentions are the starting place for trust. The foundation is the other person believing your intentions are aligned with their best interests. You know, something that strikes me, Genevieve, is is the clients that you work for, um, whether that be Instagram or whether that be Planned Parenthood or more recently with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. These are all clients that the public has very strong beliefs about. Yes. Where do you begin? It's a complicated question. And I think, you know, as I said, with with the secretary or, you know, technology companies or big brands and that kind of thing, um, is to know that in the same way that I know my husband in a different way than his boss knows him, that there are variations of relationships and that I'm going to have access to and insights on um on how those companies or how those individuals work that I'm gonna wish people could know. Like I will wish until I were dead that people knew the Hillary that I knew because she's the greatest. Um, And how do you bridge that? Genevieve shares another one of her key tactical strategies that she calls receipts. You can't speak publicly about women's equity if you have massive pay gaps on your staff or bad family leave policies. You can't make Creative campaigns for Earth Day, if your organization is mining in the Okavanga Delta or if you have a messy supply chain, if you as an individual or an institution are not worthy of the things that you are storytelling about, if they really are just that, just stories and not creative framings for the authentic work that you're doing, then there's a world of hurt in your future. So when I say receipts, what I really mean is do the work, make it true again and again, consistently over time. Do this for a bunch of reasons. First of all, it inspires you. It gets you up in the morning because you really believe in what you're doing. Second of all, it makes your work unimpeachable and irrefutable because you have the receipts. You've done it. You deserve the right to be talking about it in public. And if you know Genevieve like I do, you'll know she's leading to a critical point. Public perception almost always follows. I say almost always because there's anomalies, right? Um, But I also think that like public perception isn't really my job. Like I'm not out there trying to change an image of someone. I'm out there trying to say, how do we put unbelievably good, irrefutable work into the world time and time again? And then really beautiful things follow. Inspiration follows, trust follows. Um, share belief follows, you know, those that perception change follows. But I'm starting it with really good work. I wanted to touch on one last thought, Genevieve, out of everything that you experienced in 2016. Was there something that really made you rethink your role, your belief in yourself? Everything about how I approach the work has changed. Uh, as a result of it. Campaigns are not won by any one individual. They're won by thousands and thousands of hard people rowing in the same direction. And it became really clear to me in the beginning of this process that my particular role in this campaign was to look for ways to be helpful and influential while divorcing myself of the need to be important. Hmm. Not not valued, because that's different. And yet, when I look back on the work, I'm proud of it because I do see that invisible hand everywhere. And I saw where I made a contribution. Um, I think it forever changed my work ethic. You know, it's like all these things they say, like, I thought I was a hard worker before I went on a campaign. I thought I was a hard worker before I had a baby. Like every time you see these like increases in your own personal velocity and campaign work was a big one for me. Um, So that's important, that humility. Um, real teamwork. I'd eat glass for the people I did that campaign with. Um, And now when I'm hiring anyone invisible hand, I say hard things with smart people. Like that's my kink. That's what we're trying to do. And that's what the campaign was. It's really hard things with really smart people. Um, And I think that love affair was a big moment for me. 
I think this this idea of doing important things without needing to be important. Mm-hmm. If we could multiply that by millions, the world in itself would be a far better place. So, um, Genevieve, I want to thank you. You do always help me think differently about something, and I think you don't even realize it, which is your power. Oh, Rachel, thank you so much. I have to say, I could say the same thing for you. I never leave a phone conversation without being like, wait a minute. I need 10 more hours just to think about and unpack everything she said. So thank you. This has been a real, it's been a treat. Always. Always. If you enjoyed this episode of Rethink Moments, I'd love it if you could leave us a review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. I'd also love for you to keep rethinking with me. You can do this by connecting with me on LinkedIn. Here you can join our community of rethinkers by subscribing to the Rethink Moments newsletter. You can also find me on Instagram and Twitter at Rachel Bosman. And I'd love to hear your ideas, questions and feedback by emailing me at rachel at rethinkmoments.com. I'm Rachel Botsman. We're back next Monday with a new episode of Rethink Moments. And thanks for listening. The show is developed and written by me, Rachel Botsman, with Will Hain and Alex Sansom. Our Rethink Moments team includes our wonderful producers, Kat Davy and Carenza Metric, and Phoebe Adler-Ryan, our researcher. Editing, mixing, and additional scripting is by our friends at Rethink Audio, Matt Hill and Anushka Tate. Sound engineering by Nick Morbath at Evolution Studios, and our original theme music is composed by Ben Sansom. And thanks to Jesse Hempel and the team at LinkedIn for all their support.